Um, so the Alumni Panel Series webinars um, are returning again. So you might be familiar, we ran these last year as well. And we invite uh, UCD alumni back to join us and talk a little bit about their careers. And it's a great opportunity because both Laura and John, who we'll meet in a moment, have, you know, sat in Theatre M and sat in Theatre P, um, were students in Newman, and they can take us through their career journey from their time in, in, in their undergrad to where they are at the moment. Um, and it gives us great insight into the, the teaching profession. So um, this, we'll have about an hour to, to chat to, to Laura and John, and really, I want to say to everyone joining that this is your session and your opportunity to find out what it's really like to work as a teacher. And there's no silly questions at all. Um, I've mentioned to John and Laura, and they're more than happy um, to answer any of the questions that you have and talk a little bit about the, the qualifications, the PME um, and their, their experience uh, as teachers. Um, so this session is run by the UCD Careers Network and uh, obviously you can see my name, I'm Michelle and I'm Career and Skills Consultant for Arts and Humanities um, and we run these for Arts and Humanities and Social Science and Law students um, in trimester one and trimester two. Um, next week our session, the webinar at the same time, same place, is on careers with languages and culture and then on the 3rd of November we have careers in the EU. The session is re being recorded, um, so it will be available on the UCD Careers Network website and on our YouTube channel as well. So enough from me. Uh, I'm sure you're uh, looking forward to hearing from Laura and John. So um, just to introduce them both, um, and I have my notes here because they've uh, extensive uh, bios to, for me. Um, so we have John O'Connor. Um, so you're very welcome, John, to our, our webinar today. Um, John completed his arts degree in 2019 uh, in geography and information and social computing. Um, and he's going to talk us to us about his experience in UCD. Um, and then he did a master's in Carlo IT in pharmaceutical regulatory affairs. And after that, decided was always interested in teaching um, and explored uh, the uh, opportunity to do substitute te teaching to get some experience um, and worked in a school teaching geography and TY modules. So we'd be interested to hear how he got that opportunity and his first experience as a, a sub teacher. Um, he's now uh, completing and just started his, uh, his PME um, and is currently teaching maths and business in the in the same school that he was subbing in. So thanks, John, and we're really looking forward to hearing your experience. Um, yeah. And then we have Laura Daly joining us. Um, and Laura has a, a, a quite a, a number of years experience in uh, teaching. So it'd be great to hear the, the contrast between John and, and Laura, just in the different career stages they're at. Um, so Laura completed her BA in English, uh, followed by an MA in Gender Studies, um, and then completed her HDIP uh, to qualify as a, a teacher. Uh, Laura also has a master's degree in leadership and management in education from Trinity, um, and also completed a graduate cert in uh, tech. Tessel um, to teach English uh, as a foreign language um, and also worked in UCD in the Applied Language uh, Centre uh, and is now teaching English full time from first years to, to sixth years. Um, so, um, and also um, shared that she worked abroad in the Netherlands uh, as a teacher teaching English. So when she took a career break. So again, really looking forward to, to hearing your experience, Laura, and I suppose really bring into life what it's really like to work as a, as a teacher. Yeah. <laughs> so we all have seen teachers in uh, in the classrooms, but really uh, there's so much more that, that goes on. So it'd be great to, to hear about that. Um, so there is a Q&A box. Um, you'll see it on the bottom of your screen. So feel free to type in any of your questions and then we'll, we'll get to those as we go through the, the session. Um, so Laura, I might start with you. Um, and maybe if we go back to your time in UCD and tell us a little bit about maybe why you picked the course that you did, um, you know, how you got involved in UCD life and maybe your decision then to do the, the MA. 
Yeah, so I, I actually began college in Trinity. I started doing business, economic and social studies and very quickly realized that it wasn't the course for me at all. So I reapplied to the CAO and I reapplied to UCD and I got English, which I was delighted with. And um, I actually was doing English and psychology with the thought that I would do psychology further. But um, actually, when I got into second year and I was doing mode one psychology, I really, really missed the English from first year. So I made another change. You know, my parents heads were destroyed with me changing courses constantly. And I switched to mode one English, which was just a pure English degree. And um, so I would have sat in, you know, the normal big lectures with everybody and then also in we had a group of about 20 in my class in my year who had chosen mode one so we had smaller modules then with them so it was a really I have to say lovely balance between I got the experience of you know the whole arts thing but then also feeling like I was part of a smaller course as well so that was great and I just adored you know the my BA in English I just I loved every minute of it and it was definitely the right choice after first year in, in Trinity to switch and to move so I'm really glad that I did and then when I was finished with the, the BA, I just felt that I wasn't really finished with, um, you know, with studying English. And I wanted to go on and the School of English offered a number of, of masters and the gender studies one just really, really appealed to me. Uh, again, a very small course, maybe like 11 of us. So got to really experience UCD life in that way. And um, as far as extracurricular goes, you know, Michelle, I was saying to you, I I didn't join enough clubs and societies now looking looking back on my time in UCD. And I think it was because um, I had the smaller courses. So I, I had a, a tight group knit of friends that maybe if you're in the larger arts classes, you don't have. So you might feel propelled towards the societies a little bit more. But it's definitely a regret of mine that I didn't you know, get involved in more of those societies while I was there. And um, so that's that kind of my plan. Yeah. And did you do, you went subbing then just before you did your HDIP, is that right? Yeah. So after I finished my master's, I was really into teaching. Uh, I thought, you know, I was pretty sure that's what I wanted to do. But I had a very unfortunate incident where I met a friend of mine, her mother, who was a teacher at the time. Um, and I remember saying, I want to go into teaching. And she totally put me off. She was saying, God, you know it's it was just a really horrible person to have met at that point in my life so I said she's like better do a bit of subbing before I make this big decision to go and, and do the H dip so as soon as I got into it and um, you know I, I started subbing down in, in a school near me it was my very first job that's actually the school that I'm in at the moment like ironically I, I came back to it after everything and um, and I got it through a guy called Michael Madigan. I don't know if he's still around, but he used to find people to, to sub in. So I subbed in four different schools over the course of that year, teaching first to sixth year classes, which was really intense. You know, I think John is doing something similar. And then I, I knew by the end of the year, if I could handle that, I could, I could handle the HDIP. So I went, I applied to UCD again and, and went back and did the HDIP. Excellent. Very good. Um, so it sounds like a great opportunity to, to try it out. And yeah. Uh, you know, just make sure it was is right for you, and uh, and John, we'll and Laura, we'll come back to your your experience in doing the H step. But uh, John, the same question, I suppose, to you. You decided to, why you know, maybe you picked English um, and the the social and information computing, and maybe your decision then to to do the masters and uh, arriving then to do the sub teaching. Uh, yes, yeah, so I suppose originally I had all throughout uh, sixth year in school, I had primary school teaching day on my CEO. I thought that's kind of what I wanted to do. Um, but then for whatever reason, I remember changing at very last minute and I wanted an arts degree. I thought because that would give me the option of, you know, primary school teaching at the end of it or else I could go for the secondary route. It was just less specialised. Um, and I opted then for geography and information social computing. They were my two subjects that I took. And then in uh, first year, I also took statistics as my minor subject because I suppose I had an interest in maths, but I wasn't, you know, it wasn't part of my favourite subject in school, but I liked that little, that element of maths and that was offered in UCD as a subject within art. So I took statistics, geography and information first year. And then I carried on with the information and the geography. And I always kind of had it in my head a little bit that having the geography would be my teachable subject if I was to go down uh, the secondary school teaching route but also then that I'd obviously have the qualification for a primary at the end of it to go on and, and do master's in that. Um, I suppose in UCD, 
uh, I had a really good time but I was with a lot of my friends from here we all kind of went together we were I suppose we had a, a big enough group going in and I suppose it's kind of like what I was saying as well I wasn't really involved too much in the societies and um, the only thing I did do was I wrote for the college newspaper it was the College Tribune at the time I think mm. it's still there um, and that was really good that just helped my writing skills I think even just for essays and things throughout college um, and even you know within schools and stuff we have a school magazine at the moment and um, I'm not really too involved in that but it's grand because I can kind of correct some stuff from some of the students and stuff like that so it does help but um, I knew kind of I suppose towards the end of my final year in UCD that I was going to have to kind of make a decision and go one way or the other but I still wasn't really 100% so I had a year out and I continued just to work in my weekend job which happened to be for Boots and um, I worked in the pharmacy side of that with which is ultimately kind of what led me into doing the, the master's in regulatory affairs. That's kind of where that kind of sparked from. But at the same time, I kind of was always brought back to teaching and that was still why I was like, right, I probably will go for this. So um, I'd actually asked my old primary school if it might be possible for me just to go back for like a week, just to do a bit of work experience or just to kind of sit in the class and see what it was like to try and make up my mind a little bit. And um it was kind of fairly obvious from being back there nearly like one or two days in that it wasn't primary school teaching just wasn't the one for me at all so I was glad because at least it kind of confirmed it and it made me think well thank god I knew I took off my CAO to begin with um, and then did that master's and then last year then I just sent my CV around to a couple of schools that were local to me just asking if they're on the off chance they want like a substitute teacher and um, and I think with the year that was in it, um, especially with different kind of supervision areas and things around COVID, that um, a lot of them were actually looking for someone. And the first one I ended up going for the interview and I just, you know, I went with, and they offered me straight away some classes to teach, but it was initially just to transition your students. So it was kind of like module based. So I was happy enough with that. And I had geography ones to teach. Um, and there was another one called EU studies as well. And we did a bit of computers as well, which kind of fitted in with what I'd studied with the information and social. Um, and then kind of after last year, towards the end of the year, like, well, that's kind of confirmed, like this is, you know, much more me than the primary school route. So by having done that time in the school, that really, really showed to me that that's where I wanted to be. So I'm glad that I did that. Yeah, very good. So it sounds like if people are joining us now and they're curious about teaching and it's like you guys, you're, it's something in the back of your minds. Um, that approaching a school or the simple act of getting your CV ready and approaching schools in your area is probably the best bet to get your foot in the door maybe and try it. And and in your experience, schools have been very open to that. And Definitely, I, I, yeah. yeah, okay. I'm good. sure, you know, probably the COVID situation has maybe had a thing on that just with, you know, they do need a bit more supervision and things. But I'd say, you know, even if maybe you were past people looking for some experience, they'd be more than happy to probably, you know, give you some kind of supervision or substitution errors if they were if they were stuck yeah definitely yeah very good I imagine you know standing in front of the class you're going to know pretty much straight away if it's for you or not you know after after a while so it's a if you confirm or, and decide your d- decision um, and Laura if we go back to you then about your your HDIP and I know it's, it's now the the PME but yeah. You might just tell us a little bit about kind of your experience of that, uh, what you enjoyed, what you find challenging, just, I suppose, to, to, to give us an insight into that that aspect. Yeah, I suppose um, it's challenging. It, well, the year that I did it, I think it's still the same format. You know, you're in the schools in the morning and then you go to the lectures in the afternoon from, from what I gather from the PMEs in our school this year. Um, so I suppose switching from teacher to student from morning and afternoon, that's that's challenging. But it is really rewarding in that in the school, I suppose you're getting uh, a lot of guidance from your cooperating teacher. So you learn so much on the job. You know, those first few months when you're really working closely with the, the experienced teacher who technically has your class that you take over from that that's really rewarding and then I particularly enjoyed you know the English and pedagogical lectures because you just even though you know you love English you love the subject it's how do you transmit that love of subject to the students and they just give you so many I suppose skills and tips of of how to transmit your knowledge effectively to to a group of you know 13 14 year olds or whatever the case may be so um those were the lectures that I suppose and I think the PMEs that I've spoken to in our school you, you still get the most out of those lectures I think as a as a student teacher okay brilliant excellent and John you're actually you're just 
starting and you're into it. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that, your your experience and the subjects you're taking? Yeah, so um, obviously, you know, depending on what your uh, first degree is, your undergraduate will depend on what subjects you can take in the PME. You just need to be compliant with the teaching council's um, requirements. So they're all kind of online. But so geography was always going to be the one that I had to take, which is fine. I was the subject I was going in for. And then the next subject, then they call it uh, in Trinity, anyway, your minor subject. So they sent out like a list and you, you only have to enroll with your one subject to begin with. But most people would have, I think, two teachable subjects. Um, that you would have and for me then obviously with having the statistics I went with maths as being my second one so you'd attend like your two uh, pedagogy modules and that so for geography and maths and then as well as that you have your other um you have your elective you have other kind of core sub core modules even so you have like ICT because it's obviously becoming quite a big thing now that a lot of our lessons are done using kind of iPads and things like that so you have your modules kind of set for you before you go in and it's just down to you then really to pick you know, the two subjects that you will teach when you become qualified. Okay, okay, very good. And you're enjoying it so far? Yeah, so far so good. Um, the workload in the PME is it's quite intense. There's a lot of, uh, you know, lesson plans and things they want you to have submitted all the time. And then, so that you're always prepared because of course, you know, a large component of it is your um, in-school inspections, which are done, you know, kind of periodically throughout the year, but you don't always get a huge amount of notice. So it's always kind of about being on top of things. And it can be quite a lot, you know, with when you're working in the school as well at the same time. And then mm-hmm. bringing home your schoolwork with, you know, your college work, it does kind of add up a lot. But, you know, at the end of the day, it is quite rewarding, though, as um, as Laura was saying. Yeah, just with the student. Very good. Very good. And um, so just into the, the chat box, I posted the, the teaching council and they, they have a really brilliant document around your subject requirements and exactly what you need to cover. And um, so that's a good guide to, for, for people to, to have a look at if they haven't seen it already. And there's brilliant resources on the, the teaching council website. Um, very good. So thanks, John. And Laura, I suppose back to you, because just to uh, remind me, did you do your grad cert straight after the... Uh, no, at the time, what they did in ECD was, I don't know if it's still running, but they gave you the option of doing the graduate certificate in TESOL at the same time as the HDIP. So I used to do that at night. So it was, I would go to school in the morning, then I'd go to college lectures. And then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'd have more lectures in the evening to do wow. the graduate certificate. Yeah, it was, was really intense, but it was only from January to June, the graduate certificate. So I was already kind of into the run of the things a little bit, but I just knew at some stage, I'd probably want to go abroad and an EAL qualification is great. And, you know, it actually ended up being, I think a huge part of the reason I got my job when I went to the Netherlands then as well, um, so it was really, really valuable. I, and they were giving us um, a discount on the fees if we did it with the HDIP. So that's why it was an incentive. So I think about 10 of us did it as part of the course. I don't, I, they might still do it. I'm not sure. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Um, and then, so once you've completed that, you uh, were telling me earlier that you actually worked in UCD for a while. Yeah, I did. I worked in the Applied Language Centre. And so I started off on a summer course when I finished my HDIP and you know, they, they do summer courses. I, I don't know with COVID if, you know, they're still getting students or, or whatever the case may be now. But then when it came to that September, I was having difficulty getting a job. So I stayed on. I ended up staying on like a year and a half in the language center and working there. And it was just fantastic experience because, um, you know, I was dealing then with older students, you know, they're, they're college students. So I had experience then with, with another sort of set of students sitting in front of me and it was just a, a great place to work I really really enjoyed my time working in UCD. Brilliant brilliant um, and maybe John to you just um, I suppose and this is something I mentioned in the intro we could you know that we we think oh we've seen teachers because we were all in school and we know what they do but there's so much going on like behind the scenes and so much extra can you maybe take us through a, a, a typical day, maybe even back when you were subbing and just the variety of the role um, and kind of maybe the aspects that we wouldn't be aware of having just been students in the class? Like there's a lot of uh, correcting, a lot of lesson planning going on. Yeah, the, the, there's an awful lot that goes on behind the scenes. And I think, you know, it's not until that you're in the position of being the teacher that you actually kind of you know realise that. And you kind of take it for granted, I think, as a student, when you kind of come into class and you just sit down and, that your teacher pulls out the lesson like it's a lot of you know time goes into that planning and of course correcting if there's any, any homework so like a typical day I suppose would be 
you come in and you'll have your work prepared for the day ahead. So that usually means that the night before. So when you come home from school, that's when you start kind of getting into your, your lesson plan. Or I mean, maybe if you're very organized, you might have it all done for a day or two in advance. But I know for myself, anyway, it's usually I come home and I'm trying, trying to get into the next day. Um, so you go about whatever, you teach your lessons, correct your homework. And then depending on the day, you could be on a supervision, which is usually on break or lunchtime. So you'll have your set days, whatever to do, cover. So you might do like the corridors, you might be outside in the kind of on the grass or whatever, just keeping an eye on, on things. Um, as well as that, then you have quite a lot of um, staff meetings will happen, usually on a Wednesday after school. So you'd be usually select to attend those. And then there's a lot of different roles in the school as well. So, I mean, there's more to it kind of than just being a teacher. So after a little while, obviously there is other roles in the school. So they have kind of, I think they're like assistant principal roles and they go in and there's a lot more work than actually, you know, just coming in teaching the class. Um, which I, I really I wasn't aware of until until last year until actually you know coming into the school and seeing it but yeah no, there's quite a lot of work that goes on it's not just you know at half three when the bell goes that's the end of the day like the teacher it's it's much longer than that and I and I found that out quite quick actually last year I haven't got in yeah very good and Laura I suppose the same question to you just to bring to life that that day what what your day looks like and I'm sure teaching first year to sixth year it's a very busy role yeah, yeah, it is. I actually, um, you know, at the moment I, I have an AP2 post as well, which is an assistant principal to post. So a, a lot of, you know, the big kind of thing in teaching now is this idea of distributed leadership going on in schools. So you'll find yourself probably on a lot of teams outside your normal class hours. So you might have, you know, as, as John was saying, meetings, but they might be lots of different committees that you're on, like an SSE committee, a school self-evaluation committee, um, like a policy committee. So, you know, and I suppose it depends on how you look at it, but it's also, it's fantastic to join those teams, you know, if you want to progress up the ranks within a school. So yeah, apart from your, your standard curriculum preparation your homework you do I, I find that there, there's more and more meetings you know which can be a good thing <laughs> sometimes tiring but it's it's definitely good to uh, you know for for progress for yourself yeah and it sounds Laura like there's lots of opportunities even just to get involved with like because there's so much going on in a school between drama yeah. and absolutely yeah and... there's another like the the one thing i would say if you are you know considering going into teaching and, and you're doing your pme or whatever get involved in all the activities that really interest you you know schools absolutely love when people go in and join debating teams or coach a, a sports team or you know get involved in student council there's, there's all these things where you can show your strengths even when you're still a pme student and that will hopefully you know any pme student that's in any way proactive I know in the schools that I've been in they've always been kept somehow so getting involved outside of the classroom even though you have a really busy year you know with with all your lectures and everything it's kind of essential if if you want you know a, a good reference or you want to stay on in the school that that you're working in. Very good and John are you involved in well I don't know where you get the time but if you have time to get involved in any extracurricular even in the um in your year when you were subbing I know you're involved in TY um, but you probably share Laura's views on that, that just the more you can bring uh, to the, the school. Yeah, definitely. I think that is a, quite a big part. And I think the majority of teachers you see will, um, will have, I suppose, something that they have going on outside of school or, you know, they'll have some activity or maybe a sport they do. A lot of teachers do. Um, last year, I was, we got, with COVID, we moved online and we got new laptops and with, again, with the information of social computing. I think they kind of think of me as like the IT guy or the tech guy. So as soon as anything new comes in, any new technology, the laptops, they're all kind of sent down to me and I was kind of working on them away for the year. So I got a bit involved that way. And then uh, over the summer, I did a course then in uh, Goshka, it's called. So some people might be familiar with it from um, transition year themselves. But so this year I'm the Goshka leader in the school. So, um, you know, we do like our hike and stuff like that. So that's probably yeah. what I'm involved in at the minute. Very good. Uh, it sounds to, I mean, to me that like great way of bringing a bit of your own personality and your own interest to the role as well. Um, and yeah, it sounds, sounds very interesting. Um, and Laura, you mentioned that you actually took a career break and went to the Netherlands. Would you like to tell us about that? Because that sounds like a really interesting aspect of your career as well. Yeah, so one thing I think that people who are thinking about going into teaching don't talk about enough is the fact that you can take this amazing career break you know and, uh, you can take it in 
two five year blocks. So I took three years nice. and I went to the Netherlands and I was living in Amsterdam and I was working in the European school in The Hague teaching the European baccalaureate um, and it was just such a different experience from you know anything in Ireland the students were different and um, the obviously the curriculum was so different I was teaching English as like what we call the L1, L2, L3 different language strands as EAL to some students and I was working with people from all over Europe and it was just it was an unbelievable experience. The European school system is set up for the children of people who work in the European institutions. So it's not a lot of people when I was away thought I was teaching the international baccalaureate, but it wasn't. It was the European baccalaureate. So it's a much smaller group of schools that, that teach that. But yeah, I would say, you know, teaching is amazing in that way. You can go off. You wouldn't even have to. You know, some people were saying, oh, you're moving to the Netherlands. Would you? you know, te- go out of teaching for a few years. But but for me, I wanted to, you know, stay within the industry or whatever. But if you are a teacher and you need a break, it, it's a fantastic opportunity. So, and I think it's, it is very overlooked when people are thinking of it as a career path. Yeah, that's, that's, that's fantastic. Um, because great to be able to step out and try something new like that and like completely broaden your experience. And I imagine yeah. you bring so much back then to the school that you... Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, like it changed my perspective on a, on a huge amount of things and, um, you know, day to day issues to do with teaching, you know, discipline, homework. I had new perspectives given the new students that were sitting in front of me um, and it gives you new ideas for your teaching because you're working in such a different environment. Uh, I also still have connections in the school that I was in. So, you know, I can make connections now between my school that I'm in with students from abroad, which, you know, that's a fantastic opportunity for for the students in, in our school or things like that. So, yeah, brilliant. And John, in your school, is that something that you'd see pe- people talk about that they've taken breaks or they're interested in it? You might have some knowledge of that. Yeah, um, I know actually that this year, one of the girls who um, we started off last year, she is now taking over fully from uh, another teacher. She's on, um, she's on a career break, but she's working on a job share now, which is another kind of thing that they can do. So they kind of split their classes in half and they'll take maybe, I know Hannah takes three and the other teacher takes three. So right. that, that as well. So if, you, if it was the case, maybe you didn't want to take on the full workload for a year or a couple of years, then you can always get another teacher and you have this option to job share which I think is also great as well yeah definitely very good um so I'm just going to check in some some questions because I can see uh some coming in the Q&A and one in chat um so Kate I think has a question just um sorry it has moved up the screen so John you mentioned for the PME you take two subjects but Kate is wondering do you need to do two subjects and can you just do one? And I'm not sure about that. I, maybe you guys would know, can you take one or do you have to take two? Um, I think, well, for Trinity anyway, they, there was, you have to take a second subject, but I, you might not be necessarily qualified to teach at the end if you don't have the um, undergraduate, if you don't meet the teaching council requirements. So you'll still have to attend the pedagogy for that subject. But obviously that would just stand to you, I suppose, if you're going for a job in a school that at least you've maybe completed this subject as well, alongside your teacher one. But as far as I know, do you need to take two um, okay. in all of them? Yeah. So like I, I only had English, you know, from my BA. So I remember when I was going to do the HDIP, I was really worried, nervous about that. You know, I don't have a second subject. What will I do? So I did. I know CSP has changed now, but I did English and C- anyone who didn't have a second subject at the time took CSP. But I do know there are teachers who teach now who are only qualified in their undergrad with, with one subject. So I think, as John said, there are ways around that if you if you yeah. want to do teaching and you feel there's only one teachable subject. You'll, you'll still be able to qualify as far as I know and I know on the on the teaching council website they have I think they have a they have a helpline or a contact number and um, mm-hmm. so and you can email them so if you if you want maybe clarification on that um, you could so hopefully that answers your question Kate and then I know coach um, I'll try and paraphrase this you've uh, a question here you're currently in your final year of your BA studying Irish and linguistics um, planning to be a secondary school teacher, um, Irish teacher, currently subbing in your local school. Brilliant. So you're getting experience. But I do not think I want to apply for the PMA straight away. 
Have either of you got any advice for people looking to get into a school for a year or two before doing the PME? Um, I think you did touch on that, but if there's anything else, I mean, probably CV maybe and... Yeah, even more than the CV, there's nothing more effective than meeting a principal face to face. I really think, you know, arriving up, asking, could you talk to the principal for five minutes and handing in your CV? I think they get a lot of letters. Principals are really, really busy. But if they see a face with the name and the CV, I think that's so that that would be my advice is to don't be afraid to actually trek around and make yourself known in the school. Very good. Um so coach yeah maybe you could look at your local area first and look at the mm-hmm. list of the schools and then maybe broaden out your search and yeah. it sounds like they're quite approachable um, and yeah I t- perfectly understand how getting a you might go to the top of the pile if you come in person rather than yeah, exactly. they get a lot of applications yeah and um, so hopefully that that answers your your question um and then Quivon, I want to become a German teacher in secondary schools. What master's degree in education should I do? Um, is it necessary? Oh, sorry, uh, that, qu- that question has moved about. Um, well, I imagine if you want to be you want to be secondary school, you'd have you do your your BME, you'd have to do your BME as well. So um, uh, the, the questions are moving about on me, but so Quivon, hopefully if you maybe have a look again at the, the Teaching Council website as a first port of call, um, because it does give your your detail, uh, uh, there's an a actual web page about getting started in teaching and then all the different subject requirements. Um, so maybe you could have a, a look at that. Um, so Sophie has a question, is it necessary, so maybe John, I might ask you this, uh, is it necessary to have experience subbing before entering into your PME? Is that a, a requirement? No. no. Not, yeah, not at so all, no. So a lot of people just come kind of straight from their undergrad even, or maybe they've taken a year out and they haven't done anything in education before, but it's not a, it's not a requirement at all. Um, the only thing I will say is that, you know, probably going in, it might make it a little bit easier that you've stood in front of the class before, but it's absolutely no requirement at all. Like, and you normally have a, quite a bit of time before anyone comes to inspect you, like you'll have gotten used to a class group by then. So there's no, there's no requirements at all for that. Okay, brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, the questions, it's great to see uh, so much uh, interest. Um, and Rachel, you have a question. I don't want to be a secondary school teacher. I'm currently teaching. I'm currently in second year of write of English with creative writing. Excellent. And I want to teach English as a foreign language. And I want to teach English with creative writing at third level. How do I go about these? Um, well, I am so Laura, you have experience in the grad search. So I imagine that's the, the first port of call. Um, there's a number yeah. of courses you can do to teach English online or teach English as a, a foreign language. Yeah, the only thing I would say is just make sure, so, so, you know, there's a lot of online courses offered, but they need to be a certain level um, for you to be properly qualified in EAL. So just make sure, oh God, I can't remember, it's level, there's, there's a, a level nine or there's some number that just to be aware that you're getting a, a proper qualification is the only thing I would say for the EAL stuff. Yeah. Very good. Um, and then I suppose if you want to teach at a third level, so at university, mm-hmm. I suppose the minimum most people would, it's certainly in like say in UCD, they would be looking for a, a PhD. Um, mm-hmm. So if you, you might get some uh, tutoring maybe or or that, but you really need to have a, a PhD to, to do that. So um, Rachel, you might want to pop into the, the Queers Network or make an appointment and we can chat to you about that. Um, so maybe just so there's lots of questions flying in there. So, um, but maybe uh, Laura, just go back to you. Um, I suppose in terms of, uh, it sounds like such a, an interesting role. Loads of variety. It's certainly not yeah. just about standing in front of a, a classroom. Um, and what just to, what you would say is you'd enjoy most and what you love about the role, and maybe just some some challenges. I mean, is it the onset of technology that's that's coming or what are the challenges that we should be aware of if we're thinking of a career? Yeah, I suppose the technology thing is, you know, when John was saying there, he's the IT man in his school. He's, he's made himself indispensable. <laughs> and we want him in our school immediately. Um, no, it's the introduction of technology. You know, I, I returned back at, during COVID and it, 
the school had been revolutionized with teams and everything but it's actually fantastic I find it much easier to to teach using all the technology but schools are always probably about 10 years behind the latest technology so there's that lag I, I suppose in equipment and things like that depending on the school that you're in and um, the challenges is for me would definitely be um you know students who just don't have an interest in your subject and the never-ending battle to try and instill a love of a subject that you have into a student who has no interest whatsoever in your subject so that's a challenge also I suppose keeping your teaching fresh uh, I've been teaching for 11 years and I've just started to kind of realize that I teach the same way as I did 10 11 years ago and how can I kind of modernize my methodologies or you know update them or new materials so I'm looking to do some CPD uh, continuous professional development in you know English to try and upskill in that way so that can be challenging you know you don't want to become stale as a teacher the longer you're in the role um, and then the rewards is I suppose for me definitely it's it's this interaction with the students you know um, get like getting to know them seeing them progress seeing them fulfill their potential it sounds you know cliche but it, it is genuinely the most rewarding aspect of the job when you have students who sit in front of you maybe from first to sixth year and they do a great leaving cert and you know they're just happy and content students that's that's the aim of the job more so than you know instilling a love of the subject even though I do try and do that <laughs> very good thanks Laura um, and John for you I know you you're a little bit newer but um what what you enjoy what you're really uh, loving about the role and then kind of challenges just what that you can see at this early stage I think what Laura said there exactly you know about when you really like something you're quite passionate about and then you've got maybe someone in front of you who just couldn't care less about it. that 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 is probably one of the, the biggest challenges dealing with just trying to get them to kind of cooperate at least or give their best um there is like I said earlier on there quite a lot of work associated with after school so corrections and that does take quite a lot of time so that's probably the thing that I'm not crazy about doing I mean I no one wants me sitting there with piles of tests going through them but that that is the reality of it you know, sometimes like and especially when no parent teacher means you might be giving tests to all your year groups if you've got them all coming up so it is can be busy in that sense and um, mm. and then I suppose challenges then for us anyway I know last year we don't have our technology is kind of only coming in now as I was saying earlier on but phones trying to get them off their phones behavior oh, yeah. issues that kind of stuff that's what you deal with quite a lot so it's just, that that would probably be one of the challenges as well yeah yeah very good that's yeah thanks for those those insights um so Rian has a, a, a lovely question here how do you find your teaching style so do you find it hard to gain confidence in your first role of teaching particularly particularly teaching senior students um, and maybe John just that you're at the starting point of this did you, can you it might be fresher in your mind in terms of thought that first time standing in front of a class is that teaching style something that you just become more comfortable with time um, I think definitely the teaching style that I had on the first day last year to now is completely different I remember you know standing up there I'd never spoken in front of such a big room of you know 30 16 year olds but yeah so things definitely changed I think as you do it as you're on the job I mean I'm sure you know having the masters you'll be going into it in a stronger position of course but for me anyway being on the job over the course of the year I've definitely kind of picked up skills and things that I would now do differently to how I did the first time but it, it does just come to you I think it takes time and it's not something that necessarily is going to be there from your first year teaching your first year in the PME it's something that definitely will grow I'm sure and like I'd hope that you know after I come down at the end of this the two-year course that I'll probably have a completely different teaching style than having done the masters do you know that kind of way so yeah I might yeah. just look changes and that you develop over time. Very good and Laura would you have any you've probably maybe seen your your teaching style change a little bit over the years and yeah, absolutely. And you kind of, I find actually you adapt to certain classes differently as well. I know, I suppose like John, the first time I stood in front of a class, I tried to be the strictest person on the planet and that doesn't work either. So you have to kind of relax into it a little bit and it does take time. But yeah, it'll, it my teaching style even today, if I think about my day, varies from class to class group, depending on, you know, the level of the class, how responsive they are. Definitely for the junior cycle students, I teach them slightly different to the senior cycle because you have to you know you have to acknowledge they're more mature you can be I suppose a little bit more authentically yourself in front of the, the senior cycle students as I would say um 
you might have a bit more of a teacher face for the junior cycle students as as they come up the ranks and then you might relax a little bit if you've had a class for you know as I said a couple of years but yeah even then I I found my teaching style changed hugely when I went abroad um just because naturally they were more relaxed about discipline and things like that so I had to kind of adjust to the environment so often I I do wonder like god if I was to move school in Dublin again would would my teaching style change again and so I think it is something you kind of have to as John said like develop and grow and it will adapt with you and with your class groups. Okay very good so Rian I hope that that that, that answers your question um, and then I think it's Quivon again when should you start applying to school placements if applying to the PME um, so I, John I might ask you that. Uh, um, I suppose I, I just say I'm the same school as last year so yeah. I didn't I suppose didn't have that, but I would definitely say as soon, like as early on as possible, because schools tend to, I think, they do have students applying to them early. So the earlier you can, the better. I'd say just to be sure you get the school that you want and that there's actually a teacher there to to be able to, to take you. Okay, very good. Um, and I see, uh, I think it's Sophie again, um, just asking about the application process for the PME. So, um. I suppose there's good there's good information on all the university websites. Um, I know like UCD um, School of Education. I think their their information. I'm sure Trinity is the same. And UI Galway. Um, so I'll just see. Sophie, I'm hoping to begin my PMA in September. How many teaching placements will we have to complete during the course? <laughs> Ooh, um, I think that I know in it's broken up into your two semesters so for the first semester I can only speak in fraternity here but um it's we have no placements at all it's nearly just that you're you're in college essentially or you're watching your lectures or you should be and then the second half the second semester is just fully in school there's no college at all so for the whole kind of second semester and then that changes for second year the whole of the first semester you're in school and then the second semester you're back in college Okay, very good. I think UCD is different. They do mornings in school and afternoons in college. Uh, yeah, I think. They all offer, I think, different ways of doing it. It, it depends yeah, on who yeah. you actually decide. To, yeah, but it's all on their website, I think, because I know when I was looking through it, that was uh, mm. something I was looking at as well, just their structure and see, yeah. Yeah, very good. So, Sophie, you might you might have a, a, a little bit of some research to do <laughs> um, just to find out what's the, the best option for you. But there is definitely loads and loads of information online. And I think the universities run webinars. I know certainly UCD do. Um, I'm sure Trinity will. Um, I'm sure all the universities do. So they're really good to get kind of your your insight. Um, and sorry, John, all the PME questions are coming towards you because <laughs> they're obviously see, uh, well, this is someone who's just started. This is great. Um, so Marek has a question. I'm a final year English and history student. I was wondering whether there would be any jobs you could work at during the summer that would be good experience for teaching um, or in, in advance of a PME. So um, that's a really good question. I'm sure there's lots and stuff you can get involved with between volunteering and throw again lots of things but I'll check in with Laura and John if they're they even know from the students they've worked with or sorry the PME students what they've been up to in their summers. Um, well I just I did some volunteering and um, I went to teach students in Tanzania for a summer so I had like a, oh. I had like an amazing summer but also then that looked good on the CV as well but it it was it's not it was unpaid you know it was volunteer work so if you're looking to to make money out of it obviously that that wouldn't be an option but yeah I'm sure you could do some volunteering um within Dublin you know and then work a totally different job that that it's not necessarily linked to teaching if if you thought that would help yeah um and John even from the the people that you know in your PME in PME now your fellow students would they have done anything interesting over the summers um, I know one or two of my friends who actually are in the PME the year, year ahead, they would have done a language, if they're language students, they've often written language summer camps doing uh, French and doing Spanish and things like that. So that's quite a big one. Um, and I know then I think you know, once you're qualified, like last year, um, I had the year done in the school. So I went and I worked for the state examinations. So I did the yeah. superintendent. That's something you can do, I suppose. Um, I think you probably do need to have a teaching council number to get it or you know to have maybe some experience in the school before you kind of go into that but um that's just another option so when you are being a teacher you do have that 
as something extra you can do during the, your summer months as well, if that's what you want. Very good. Um, so, Mark, I'd look at um, studentvolunteer.ie and um, UCD in the community. There's uh, offer lots of opportunities. Um, the, there's clubs, so many clubs and societies in the university besides the UCD. There's like from the Harry Potter Society to and everything in between. So there's something for everyone. And you might find a great way to, to kind of build skills and you might get involved in organizing events and things like that. Um, and then have a look at UCD Foundation um, and maybe in the summer, like, yeah, looking at, keep an eye on, I suppose, UCD, uh, my careers. We often put up uh, kind of internships and kind of interesting roles. Active Link is good as well if you're looking at roles in the community. So I think there's lots of opportunities to build skills that would be really useful in, in, in teaching. So hope that that helps. Um, so I'm just going to check this Q&A box as well. So we've, we've questions coming in, in lots of different directions. I think we might have. Um, so someone was asking just what's the difference between the HDIP and the PME. So the HDIP is just the old name for it. So it's the uh, uh, Masters in, in Education now. It's just it was renamed. So that's all. Um, oh, yeah. So a uh, question for you, Laura. So, Laura, what qualifications did you need to teach in the Netherlands? Was it just the, the grad cert they had mentioned, the, the TESOL or what had you? Um, was no. So they they wanted me. So I had to be qualified as an as an as an English teacher in Ireland. So I needed the HDIP. Okay. Um, the grad cert was just kind of an extra string to my bow when I was applying for the job. But yeah, they were looking for, so the year that I was hired there, they actually hired three teachers from England as well. So, you know, they, what the main thing they were looking for because I'm an English teacher was that I was a native language speaker. So anyone from England or Ireland with a, a teaching qualification was, you know, really really wanted so that's what I would say if you, you know as a native if you're in, want to become an English teacher having being a native language speaker will actually get you a job pretty much anywhere within Europe I think or within the world it's, it's really desired let's say but that's specifically I suppose I'm being very specific there just with English but yeah very good. So I hope, uh, Evita, that answers your question. Um, and I suppose this question is coming from maybe the fact that both of you have, like, so your HDIP and John, you're doing your PME, um, but you also both have masters. So somebody is asking, do you need, you know, is that, I suppose, an advantage to have a master's and as well then your professional quality? teaching qualification but that's not necessary as far as I understand that the, you've done that based on your interests is that correct Laura and John yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah I like I just I just wanted to do the master's in the gender studies I was just particularly interested in it like I do I think it helps me it helped me perhaps get my job yes absolutely like I think the more education you have the better is it necessary absolutely no and for me the HDIP because it was called the HDIP it was the higher diploma in education whereas now the PME is a master's so I wanted to do a master's because the dip wasn't a master's if you know what I mean um, and yeah. so for me that was just a, a personal choice and um, but yeah if I would say if you are interested in your subject in being in you know in, in doing a master's in your subject go for it but the only downside is then that the PME is another two years then whereas I only had to do one year you know for my H dip. so it might yeah. be too long in college I don't know depending yeah. on how much you like college and <laughs> um, yeah so just if anyone's that the HDIP is just we're referring to like the historic yeah. name first um, and yeah. but now you're looking at the the PME for for teaching and um, so maybe that question just both you know people hearing your stories just noted the the masters and so Laura you've two masters <laughs> yeah. well I, I suppose my career ambition is to go into management and um, so I, I wanted to get a, a, a master's in education management. So yeah, that was really enjoyable. I went back in 2015, you know, when I hadn't studied and in, in, I gave myself a good long break of just the teaching and I hadn't yeah. studied and it was part time in the evening. And I just, I really enjoyed being a student again. You know, it, yeah. it was, it was a fantastic experience. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah, very good. Um, so yeah, and the same with you, John, you just pursued, pursued another interest, but 
even the experience I'm sure of completing that masters um, can only help with your your PME so um, very good so um, that's uh, probably someone uh, picking up on your extensive qualifications <laughs> I'm wondering what's ahead for them um, very good um, well no you've given a brilliant insight I think uh, really brought the, the query to life um, and I think we've probably covered any, everything but if just even from both of you if there was like a, a closing comment if you're to the current students like I suppose what, what you would say maybe just I suppose getting involved in, in university life and um, if, if there was anything you wanted to just add to, to say maybe Laura first to you and then John um, yeah I just want to say thanks a million for having me on you know I've, I've really enjoyed it and think back on my time in UCD it was it was fantastic so I suppose my my one piece of advice would be the one thing I didn't do is to get a bit more involved in, in the societies and you know like John I suppose I went to college with a lot of my friends from the area so to try and branch out a little bit it it's really important and you know to uh, if you are thinking of going into teaching like it it's a fantastic career and there's a lot more to it maybe than you first might think and there's also ways to to progress and you know take breaks and branch out so it can be a more varied career than perhaps when you think of it first as, as someone who's just come from school so I I love it I think I really recommend it and uh, you have to like kids though to, to be a teacher you know the love of the subject is one element and I suppose the getting on with the secondary students is, is a massive part of it so yeah anyone who's thinking about it just best of luck it's it's a really enjoyable career brilliant and john the same to you i know you've shared loads of your experience with the pme and advice and everything um but i would say you know especially for myself like i was really kind of stuck between choosing like i couldn't make up my mind so for me i would say the best thing is just to even try and get a little bit of experience in in a secondary school because that will tell you you know straight away if it's for you or not because you're either I, I say you would love it or hate it if you're when you're up at the top of the class teaching groups of, group of you know whoever that that will tell you straight away if it's for you or, for, or if it's for you or not so that would be what I'm safe to do um yeah. which I, it is a rewarding job and I'm glad that I've chosen and I'm, I'm really happy in it yeah brilliant yeah you both sound you can definitely know notice and pick up on the, the passion and the interest you have um so I suppose, um, firstly, just to say thanks so much, uh, both Laura and John, for your, your time and your insights. And uh, you shared a lot. And I think that the, your conversation generated an awful lot of questions, which is always, always great. And clearly people really, I suppose, appreciate a chance to, to hear kind of really because it's one thing to look up a website, but to, to hear from both of you, uh, it's it's brilliant. Um, uh, to everyone in the audience, I, I've shared an evaluation link, which it just takes like about five seconds to, to complete, but it just helps us, um, you know, check in if there's other um, uh, webinars that you'd like and, and things like that. Um, and what I would say is, again, to the audience, the there was a lot in it and lots of content and lots to think about. So be sure to have a look at the recording maybe and just uh, reflect on the, the kind of advice that might help you uh, gather a bit of an act, a career action plan for yourself and decide what you might like to do in the, in the summer and, and going forward. Um, and then also thanks to my colleagues, John and Michael in UCD alumni, because I know they would have been liaising with Laura and John and um, and helping us uh, supporting UC careers in, in, in operating this, this webinar series. So thanks very much. We really appreciate your help. Um, and then just thanks to all our participants. Thanks for all your brilliant questions. Um, and I really hope you found it really useful. Um, and uh, Laura and John, I better let you back to your day because you're busy people. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and uh, it sounds uh, like you're you're you have your hands full and lots lots to do. Um, but continued success to you both. And uh, John, best of luck in your your PME. And Laura, best of luck in your yeah. in your role and your continued success in your career. And uh, thanks to you both. Um, much appreciate your your time. Great. Thanks again, Michelle. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.